animal control in the city is, is better code enforcement. Uh, this should be dealt with as a, as a civil problem under civil law. I, I don't believe criminalizing dog owners is a good solution. Uh, we certainly need the enforcement. Uh, we need more tickets written. Uh, we need more individuals held accountable. And you heard from the Director of Planning and Development that there will be uh, two new code enforcement officers who are able to be hired under community development black grant dollars. So uh, I would ask Council to allow the new personnel uh, to enforce the current laws that are on the books. Uh, let's see what kind of results we get from that approach. Uh, let's allow the police to focus um, on the serious cases. Of course, they get called when a dog is out of control. Uh, there, there's a police um, solution for serious animal control issues with a shotgun uh, when that gets necessary. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think we want to get into long legal criminal proceedings uh, against individuals around, um, around these dog bites. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Nair Sharif, and I just, there, there is a clerical error on, um, I guess it's page two under um, section uh, B, defining vicious dog, the um, tendency is misspelled. Uh, <laughs> but beyond that, um, I, get, I mean, I'm not a dog owner, but I do know several people who own dogs for, for safety and um, companionship. And I think that all this stuff, um, especially like when you're, it says like a, a dog that has a ten, tendency or propensity or disposition to attack, um, I think that number one, this, is, this will create um, a trend where you're going to have possibly either more people um, taking their dogs to the pound. And so that's going to create um, a backlog at the um, Humane Society and Dog Pound. And then two, um, you'll just have more people um, not registering their dogs. Um, and that's its own um, kind of like ball of, ball of wax. And um, I think that once we actually enforce the stuff that we have on the books, um, that that will kind of alleviate um, some of those things because a lot of people, they have like their dogs, mostly because of the police aren't coming. So I remember I had a friend who whose house was broken into and the police didn't come for days, but it was a person next door that their dog was stolen and then the police came and then we were kind of like getting the people to come, getting the police to come check out the, the house that was broken into. So um, I think that once you, number one, ch change, the <laughs> change the clerical error and then um, hopefully not moving forward with this ordinance and going back to the drawing board. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the city council on this ordinance? Is there anyone else? at 533 East Rankin Street. And I think it's, it's somewhat of a balance here. I think that I would hate for people to train dogs for illegal fighting and so on and so forth. Uh, and when those dogs attack uh, an innocent person, I think that person should be held criminally in, uh, charged. I was, uh, and this was in, uh, on Lewis Street in I guess the Beecher District out there. I saw a, a bulldog on Saturday, a rope hanging from a tree, and the book and the uh, the dog was jumping oh, about six feet in the air, grabbing. So you know what I'm talking about. They training that dog, and if that dog get, I saw it Saturday. I told you the street it was on with my own eyes. And I said, well, that dog is being trained to fight. I mean, he must have jumped six feet or, or better in the air. So I think it's a balance. I think that the laws already state that if you own any animal, it could be a donkey on your property, and it hurts somebody, then you're civilly liable. But then I think that we also, you know, 
people that have these uh, vicious animals, uh, they should be, it should be criminalized. Now, somebody said a misdemeanor is not, I mean, it's just a misdemeanor. I mean, it's like a parking ticket. You know, it's a misdemeanor. You know, uh, didn't pay your ticket, they issue a warrant for your arrest. So I'm kind of this way on that ordinance. I uh, just want to weigh in. I, you know, uh, I, I think it should be uh, if you, you know, if somebody get hurt by one of those dogs being trained, then what? It's just a civil misdemeanor? I mean, you know, and we got a lot of dogs in the hood. I mean, a lot of them running wild. So I, I mean, that didn't help you all none. I don't Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else that would like to address the city council on this ordinance? Is there anyone else that would like to address the city council on this ordinance? Is there anyone else that would like to address the city council on this public hearing for this ordinance? This public hearing is closed. Mr. Uh, President. Mr. Mr. President. I've got Mr. Neely first. Councilman Neely? Yes. Let me go ahead and bring up um, some clarity about this. You know, for those who are watching at home and those of you who are here uh, about how this, uh, this ordinance was erected and how we're going to try to perfect some of the dog control inside the city of Flint. Many people that I hear come to this microphone all through the night and all through the day to talk about city council being responsible and doing their jobs to protect and provide more service for the residents inside the city of Flint. This did go through a process. All people that was on the legislative committee voted for the modifications and the changes to be brought back to the floor. That did happen. This process was not fast-tracked. This has been worked on for the better part of a year, going back to the previous emergency manager prior to this council that's seated currently now. Now, when we talk about public policy and policy being set to protect residents inside the city of Flint, we need to make sure that all residents and the most vulnerable residents, our children and our seniors, are protected. We've had more than 22 dog attacks in this year of children and senior citizens. The maximum charge that can be charged for any particular legislation that we put forth as a council is a misdemeanor. It's not a felony. You will not have to check the box when you go to apply for a job at Taco Bell or Walmart. It's a misdemeanor. Punishable by $500 and or 90 days in jail. Now this is an owner responsibility ordinance, and it's a modification to the vicious dog ordinance. Now I hear, you know, I saw the mayor talk, and I'm going to address that, and I saw Mr. Murphy speak, and I will address that as well. But to take it civilly, in a poor community, this is what happens. And this is what happened to your secretary, uh, granddaughter, uh, Mr. Mayor. She was attacked by a dog. She was viciously attacked by a dog of one of her neighbors. Well, don't interrupt me, Mr. Mayor. Don't interrupt me, please. Because I didn't see you come to the microphone to d d dispute uh, street lighting assessments or the reduction of police officers in the community, but you want to talk about dogs. So when you're civilly attacked, you have the right to find due process through a lawsuit. But if that person doesn't have homeowner's insurance, renter's insurance, or if they're poor, you have nothing to gain by a lawsuit. All those medical costs, therapy, is going to be footed on you. So how do we curve this as a, as a unit of government? How do we come up with a piece of legislation that's going to benefit all of us? Let's make the owner's responsibility. So if the owner is not responsible, if they're training their dog to protect nefarious activity, drug activity in their home, fighting dogs in a community, making these dogs more vicious, let's make that owner responsible for the actions of that canine. The Animal Rights Activist supports this ordinance. We drafted it together. And so we move forward to try to protect the most vulnerable in our community. Mr. Murphy, if you don't own the animals, the animals are not your responsibility if they t attack someone. This ordinance is to gain awareness about making sure people are safe. Not on Kensington Street, Mr. Mayor, but I'm talking about on Russell and Austin where dog fighting is, is more prevalent. 
or where they found the 12 dogs in, the, in garbage bags over in the fifth ward. Them dogs didn't kill themselves and put them in garbage bags. So we have to produce public policy that protects all of our residents. Now, if we have to delay it, perfect it, or whatever we have to do, whatever the will of this body is, but this is still in our wheelhouse. This is something that we can do as a council to protect our residents inside the city of Flint. I don't want to see another child mauled or another animal, a domestic animal attacked by a vicious dog where, where it kills that animal, a senior citizen trying to catch a bus that it cannot defend themselves. 22 dog attacks this year. 22. So if they have to go to jail for a couple of days or pay a fine, I think we ought to make, bring some, some awarenesses about owner responsibility for canine owners. I'm responsible for my dog, and maybe you might be responsible for your poodle, Mr. Mayor, but we have to uh, move forward as a, a council and do what we need to do. Thank you, Councilman Neely. Mr. Yeah. Mays, Councilman Mays. Yeah, Mr. President, through you to the chairperson of the legislative committee, Mr. Neely, and to the audience, I'm here to tell you it's three people on the legislative committee. Chairperson Neely, Councilman Scott Kincaid, and Councilman Eric Mays. And I'm here to tell you that as a legislative body, one of our most important <coughs> functions is to make law. They call them ordinances. They call them city ordinances, legislation. And if I sit here and tell these 20 or so people left in this room, under the eyes of God, that I haven't met in the legislative committee. And I'm appalled that an ordinance bypasses the legislative committee, goes through the city attorney, and I know for a fact I don't always appreciate the law that the city attorney gives me. And I know Mr. Neely don't neither when he don't like it. But this particular law he likes. So he now wants to bypass the legislative committee and fast track it through the city attorney. I stand by my guns between, in front of these 20 witnesses and God. If Josh Freeman, finance chair, can have meetings that he won't and need to have some more. If Mrs. Van Buren can have public safety meetings, and I have no problem with Ms. Van Buren, I talk to her. Mr. Neely can call me. I seen this draft of this ordinance as a member of the legislative committee when I picked it up today on the back of that table. That's appalling. As an elected council person who lives on Russell Street who don't see more dog fights on Russell and Austin, I'm going to speak what I was elected to do. I was elected to, not, to, re to, to represent one ninth of this ward. People can portray me as somebody who don't know Robert's rules. They can try to portray me as an episode, but the fact of the matter is I probably set up here more educated than some. My degree is from Michigan State Political Science Pre-Law. I'm in my field. And so, Mr. Neely, Mr. President, through you and to Mr. Neely, when that legislative committee meet, when we review the ordinance through the proper process and it refers out of the legislative committee then to the council and go the right way, then and only then will I speak on it. I cannot support movement on stuff as important as legislative that don't come through its proper channels in the legislative committee and I don't have to make up stuff. If I tell you something, it's more important for me to tell the truth about process and procedure than it is to go to hell sitting up here lying. I'm an honest guy. God bless you. Mr. Chair, if I can bring some light no, to this. No, I'm not going to get into the Well, I just want to remind, the, remind the committee, because the committee council, meeting happened. Let me ask other council people first, then I'll come back to you. Please. Okay. Is there anyone else, any other council members that would like to speak on this ordinance? at this time? Okay, Councilman. I'm sorry. I just, want, I just want to say, you know, um, I live in that area around Austin and, and, um, and Ruth Street, and I sit on that animal control subcommittee over across the street, 
and I get reports from the animal control officer, and it's not an overabundance of dog fighting in that particular area, you'll actually be surprised where we find more dog fighting taking place. It's actually in the middle part of the city, like the fifth and the sixth ward, to be perfectly honest. So I just wanted to make sure that we bring some clarity to that because one thing, oh, and also, also in the second ward as well, too, because that's where we found a lot of them at. But that's one thing that we've really been pushing, too. But, you know, it's not just one particular breed because anybody can train a dog to be a vicious dog. And a lot of times these dogs become feral dogs if they're, if they're loose for some time. Because a couple of days ago I was riding to work on University Drive, and um, I saw um, it was a German Shepherd with a dead raccoon or something that he picked up. He probably was taking it to her puppies or something. So, you know, it is real prevalent and, you know, throughout the city. So I, I do think that the owners need to be held accountable for this. So, um, you know, moving forward, I think that the ordinance uh, is a decent ordinance. Um, I think that we've had some dialogue on it, and I'm ready to move forward with it. So I'd like to call a question. Well, we have another motion. Yeah, so, nobody's made a motion. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, 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 I thought they made a motion. Well, Councilman, move, move, move motions, no, I, I would like to just please hold on. Okay. I'm, I'm just motions, no, I want my colleagues to have an opportunity. Anyone else? Any of my other colleagues on the dog ordinance? Jackie? Thank you, uh, Mr. President. <clears throat> I'm just hoping that once we um, support, if we do, this ordinance and it's moved, that um, it's not an ordinance like all the other dog ordinances on the books. We do nothing with them. We really do nothing with them. We have people running around the city of Flint don't have dog tag the first. <laughs> That's the big thing. Um, we have dogs running around here haven't had their proper shots. We have broken every dog rule that is imaginable. And I am just wondering, with um, the police at the stretch marks, how do we make sure that this ordinance is enforced? That is the problem, the enforcement of the ordinances. Because if we enforce what was already on the books, then a lot of people probably wouldn't have the dog that they have today. So my point is, how do we get this ordinance enforced? And once again, as Mr. Nolan said, I know there have been numerous dog fight, the rings that have been broken up in the second war, and the dead dogs that have been found in the second war. But my point is, how do we make the owner of the dog accountable because we haven't made them accountable for getting a license. We haven't made them accountable for getting a dog shot. So now here we have something else and I'm sure it's not because Mr. Neely is running for state rep because he's been on dogs for quite some time now. But that's my, you know, do we, what we have to pad this once it's, it's done. Thank you. Anyone else before I come back to Councilman Neely, who is the sponsor of this ordinance? Councilman Neely? Yes, I just want to, uh, I want to digress because I... Who did? Oh, I'm sorry, Vicki, I didn't see your hand. I'm, I apologize. Right. What Thank I want to add Neely. is more or less uh, understanding of the need for this ordinance. It's more that we ha have something, someone accountable for something that possibly could be very tragic happening to an individual, a child, a mailman, and that has happened in the area. The dogs will come rushing out of the house and attack a carrier or a child that's playing in the yard and neighbors have to fight to get that dog off. It's not something where the, I mean, if the owners are doing what they are supposed to be doing, they, the situations would not be happening. But because there's a lax in knowing that this dog has a potential to cause harm, someone has to be held accountable. And this gives the victim or the family a, a little bit more 
uh, cloud to go after some help for the one that was assaulted by the dog, especially a lot of them get attacked in the face. Um, so as to the who's going to enforce it, well, I don't think we have anybody around to enforce it before it happens. The attention to this will happen after the attack, and then the families or the individuals will have a re recourse to go to to help them in this awful situation. If you know of anyone who's been attacked, you know, that person is going to be <coughs> going through so many probably surgeries, pain, disfigurement, afraid to be in contact with dogs. I, I mean, you know, we do have a number of the dogs in this community that could be responsible for doing something like this. So this just brings it to the attention of the owners. Hey, don't get yourself in these type of situations. Pay attention to what, what you are doing with your dog as to how you are making them under control. You know, I think anyone who owns dogs basically likes to have them around. And I don't care if it's dogs or cats or whatever, but being a dog owner myself, I like having my pet. And I would do anything to make sure that she does not do anything wrong to someone. I don't, you know, that, that's important to me. I do not want that happening to anyone. But we also have to make the owners aware that, hey, we are putting you on notice now. You know, if something happens because of your lacks, uh, how you are controlling your dogs, especially around other people for whatever reason, you are going to have something to answer to. You're going to be accountable, and there will be a cost to this. It's not just, oh, well, that isn't my dog, or he, nor he doesn't act like this, or whatever. This can go further, and this would give the victims a little bit more clout to get some justice in this situation. That's it. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilman Neely. Yeah, I, I do want to. I'm, I'm coming back to Councilman Neely. He's the maker of the ordinance. You, right. You yeah. Everybody uh, else is saying no. I'm going to digress because right. I don't want my colleagues to, or anybody to be offended because I mentioned a couple streets where dog attacks could have happened or could not have happened. But this is a citywide problem, a citywide issue that we all have to address. Now, I do want to talk about the. Um, it did go through the proper procedure. It did go through committee because on that day we had a committee meeting. We had four items on our agenda. We had three items dealing with medical marijuana inside the city of Flint. We pro and then we provided a moratorium for that. We moved and postponed that. We made the modifications to the uh, owner or, um, owner responsibility ordinance for this for the dogs. We forwarded uh, to the uh, law department for the modifications. But we pro before we forwarded it with the modifications on the amendment. We then voted it to this body for consideration. So it went through the proper process, and I do understand the process of this because I've been on council for quite some time, performing, uh, putting out public policy for quite a while. But it did go through the appropriate process. But we do have a responsibility as one of the co-equal branches of government inside the city of Flint to play our role effectively. We make laws. The administration handles the day to day. We have to put laws forth that will protect residents. It is up to the administration to enforce the laws that we put forth. We can't say that in some occasions that we don't have the ability to enforce the laws that we provide to protect the residents because if that's the case, we haven't solved a lot of murders in our community. We don't just say let's not put a law out there uh, you know, reducing the, the penalties or just saying let's take it off the books because it cannot be enforced. We have to find ways to protect our residents. And I'm trying to figure out a way to protect our residents, our children, and our seniors, and people so they can go walk around the block or we're on the track at Northern High School or the kids can play at Summerfield Playground or Bunch Elementary without worrying about a canine that got loose or a 10-year-old kid was walking a dog and could not control that dog uh, and it got loose and attacked somebody. We've seen that happen in our community and I'm putting this ordinance forth and it's not political. And this has been on the books for, we've been working on this for quite some time, so it's not been fast-tracked. And if it gets political, that's fine, but I'm trying to do our very best to protect the residents of the city of Flint, and this will help do that. Thank you. Did you want to? I, I will move this for approval. 
It's been moved and supported. Discussion? Yeah, Mr. President, under the discussion aspect of it, I will stick with what I said. I know what happened in that committee meeting because I'm a member of the legislative committee. We made some recommendations and we sent it to the city attorney's office. It should come back from the city's attorney's office to the legislative committee so we can look at what he came up with. And then we discuss it as a committee. I'm not new, um, Councilman Neely. I've been here when Matt Taylor and them was council people. The legislative committee used to meet as a committee of the whole. All committees met as a committee of the whole. So I wouldn't have to debate with you and Scott Kincaid about whether it came back to committee. I know the agenda you're talking about because everybody as a whole was a committee. You know, I've been in committee meetings in that back room before Scott Kincaid was a councilman. That was over 20-some years ago. So even though I'm newly elected council person, I probably sit in more committee meetings and council meetings than uh, most of the people in this room. So I don't want to keep hearing that about um, old and new council people. I might be a freshman councilman, but I do know for a fact that you can check the record before you got here. The legislative committee was the committee of the whole. This three-person committee is something new. Scott and Early and them invented this. And maybe they invented it so you can bypass committees. If I'm a member of the Legislative Committee, my duty is to know the law that's being made up and sent out to the citizens, each and every law. Not only was this on there, but medical marijuana dispensaries was on there. I would be appalled if it came back through like this did, without me seeing it through Legislative Committee. So I'm not going to keep going back and forth with you on this, because I, when I say something, I don't like to be discredited publicly when I know the facts. And so since you want to keep talking about proper procedure and committees, and I've been here since we used to meet as a committee of the whole, I'm not going to support it because it didn't go through its proper procedure. And the more that you try to make me wrong, it's the more pissed off I get. That's in plain words. Don't try to discredit me in a public meeting when I say something didn't come back to legislative committee. I'm in a transparent government. I'm in a fair government. If we're going to do finance committee, we need to do legislative, public safety. It's going to be no discrimination under my watch for committee work. Okay, it's been moved and supported. Is there any more discussion? Roll, Madam Clerk. I'm sorry, Madam Clerk. Mr. Mays? No. Ms. Popola? Yes. Mr. Nolden? Yes. Mr. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Davis? I'm staying. Legally, there has to be a reason, a proper reason given. For I'm staying because I didn't hear what the people wanted. I, 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 my vote is based on if the people want this vote to go through. I, I, I believe I got bit by a dog riding my motorcycle, so I'm in agreement with my colleague and other colleagues that vote yes. But my thing is I don't like to make a vote, a vote on something that the residents is not fully abreast to or nor telling me if this is what they want me to do because first and foremost, I am a representative of the people. And if the people wants me to say yes on this, then I say yes. If the people wants me to say no, but I haven't heard if the people want me to say yes. I mean, I haven't. And I don't want to be cruel towards dog owners because some dog owners may not want this. Some dog owners may feel that the pressure is going to be put on them. And now they're going to be charged in a criminal activity, and I don't want that to happen. To them, so I say Mr. no. Neely? Mr. Neely? That's the reason why I say no. Mr. Neely? Yes. Ms. Galloway? Yes. Ms. Van Buren? Yes. Mr. Kincaid? Yes. Vote is seven yes, one no, and one abstention. Mr. President? Now, now is the time for the public to address the City Council. Ms. Brown will call your name 
and I, I understand there are a couple people that did not get, didn't know or didn't get slips turned in, so at the end I will allow them to speak, Councilman Taylor. So I'm going to let Madam Clerk go through the list first. I know most of the people that filled out a slip have probably already gone, but um, for those that are here, um, in fairness, I'm going to let her call your name. Okay, Pastor Harold Jones. Mr. President, what was that vote count on the vote? What was the vote count? The vote count again was seven yes, one no, and one abstention. Okay, thanks. Mr. President and members of the City Council, um, historically Flint has been a major bulwark for automobile construction. And in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we had uh, 10 plants, I think, for a population of 191 people, 1,000 people. That was quite a bit uh, of activity here. Since then, we have found that uh, asbestos has occurred in many of our retired uh, employees and uh, we have found that many of them are qualified to receive benefits from an asbestos fund uh, that has been set aside in the city of Philadelphia, totaling about $40 billion. I am here to introduce you to two gentlemen, a Mr. Ricky Rowan and a Mr. Lane Murray, who are assisting our citizens in helping them to discover and ac access those benefits. And I'd like for you to hear them, and if there's any way the city council can inform your constituents about what they have to offer and assist them, it would be greatly appreciated. We're, we're going we're to allow them to speak as soon as we go through the list. So as we go through the list of people that came here at 5.30 or whenever, they'll have the opportunity to speak though, okay? So Ms. Brown will call your name or their name and they will be able to speak. Ricky Rowan and Mayor. Okay, go ahead, Madam Clerk. I have to call the names in the numerical sequence in which they signed in. So the next person uh, who signed in is Mr. R.L. Mitchell. I'm Mr. R.L. Mitchell, I live at 3512 Mildred Street. I'm telling us epidemics happen in Flint. You get the real citizen out of Flint. But I'm staying in Flint to face the duration. Or uh, to you, Scotty, to, um, uh, to the councilman in First Ward, I was told by the, the motorcycle people, they got the club towed down at the Eagle Club, and they told me to announce to Mace to build them another one. Because his daddy owned that property of Shiloh Baptist Church. And I just wanted to put that on the record. And uh, to, to eliminate all this blight in the neighborhood, Operation Green. And, and uh, Donna early starting this so-called stuff between the public, think the public ain't going to go. Man, and I oh, the Muslim declared the right. It's time for war and get, you already paid for it. You've been paid for it since you've been in that seat, ever since you was, got hired in the city hall. And taking these, man, just wait, wait till them bricks start in Grand Blank. I can, if you, man, and the, the Davidson dude, he's he right, man, he, Come on with it, with the people, and all this premeditated dictating people's around here and drunken and all these drunken religious stuff and up, treating the four-legged dog and two-legged dog and biblical talking junk things up. A Christian concern passes any number of pushovers. You drunken heathens, think you is drunken drunk. Ms. Carolyn Shannon, Ms. Shannon. Uh, 
To the Mr. President Scott Kincaid and to the city clerk, a phenomenal woman, Inez Brown, and to the great counsel that God has given to us, you are not here by your own means. You are here by the grace of God, all of you. I want to thank you for your effort for this evening. But it's a, some changes have to be made. We do not need any outsiders coming in here running our city. This is the worst time of our lives. When they fill their pockets up, they leave. We're still, we're still left with a deficit. Right. And what they're doing to the citizens of Flint that have been here most of their lives is egregious. And I'm going to tell you another thing. Uh, Mr. Nolan said judification, but it's more than judification. It's called a cleansing. Do you know what a cleansing is? Okay. I don't want to dwell on that. Our water bills are outrageous the lackluster leadership in this city has made us downtrodden. Right. I'm asking you to stand up for us. We'll stand up for you, and you must stand up for us. Yes. The thing is, I can't afford to live here. I'm not here because the emergency manager want me here. I'm here because of the grace of God. I don't have any money. I pay it all in my water bill. And we have the highest rate insurance, car, home ownership, whatever. We in Michigan have the highest. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to vote, 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 and get everybody you can to vote. That is a democracy that seem to have slipped through our fingers. The vote counts. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, President. Mr. Our next speaker is Sharon Streeter. Sharon Streeter. Okay, I was at the last council meeting and um, I didn't know the proper procedures. But to the council members and citizens of Flint, Michigan, and I'm addressing the city council and the citizens of Flint, Michigan, of the horrible conditions and treatment of inmates of the Flint and Genesee County Jail. I was incarcerated on April 11th at 6 p.m. by University of Michigan campus police for running through a yellow light to turn red as I passed through. I had my license ran through a computer and the policeman found an outstanding bench warrant for delinquent taxes and I was taken immediately to jail. I was lied to by the policeman and told that I would see the judge and that I could make bail and be free that night. Well, I spent seven days in jail under the most horrible conditions imaginable. Twenty women who were also charged with bench warrants, which are misdemeanors, were crammed into a room with four beds, filthy mattresses on the floor. I was pepper sprayed for reasons unknown, thrown in an isolation cell. Then when we were moved to the county, I was thrown into another isolation cell with a straight jacket and had to sleep on a cement floor naked. The cell was filthy, cold, and infested with fleas. I told the police I was on meds and my blood pressure became dangerously high. The meds I take cannot be stopped immediately. I was lied and threatened to constantly. When I got out of jail and went to court, I found out that two of the delinquent tax years already had been paid and the city had not been notified. I thought in America convicted people were innocent until proven guilty. The Flint City Police are always right, which is a Gestapo attitude. That's right. That is a general attitude of policemen in America. The city of Milwaukee had to pay million of dollars to families of the victims of Jeffrey Dahmer. 
Two of his victims ran to the police for help after escaping from Jeffrey's apartment, and the policeman turned them right back to the scene of the crime. One was killed by Jeffrey, and the other managed to escape again. In New York City, in the case of the Central Park jogger, she said she was repeatedly gang raped by, by a gang. Ten to twelve black boys were beaten into submission by the police and spent over ten years in prison until a Hispanic male confessed to the crime. I am addressing the city council mainly because I was arrested by a University of Michigan Flint policeman and I feel like I'm a, racial, a victim of racial profi profiling. Before I go, I would like to say I was present at the last city council meeting and the mayor proposed to cut the police budget. The city of Flint could save thousands of dollars by not incarcerating misdemeanor charges and men who have not paid child support payments and don't have jobs. Flint has one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. One of the reasons the crime rate has gone down is because people are moving out of the city to find employment elsewhere. When there are no jobs, people are going to resort to illegal means to make money. You can't draw blood out of a turnip. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Kilbreth. Mr. Kilbreth, the pass. Mr. Ricky Rowan. Mr. Rowan. Good afternoon to the President of the Council, to the Council members. Uh, my name is Ricky Rowan. We are here uh, from the city of Jackson, Mississippi to uh, let the citizens of Flint know that we are here to do asbestos screenings in your area. Uh, in, the, in the plants here in the city of Flint and in the surrounding areas, uh, the residents have an opportunity to take advantage of uh, a free asbestos screening to let them know or to let them see if they have been tested positive or negative for asbestos fibers. Uh, we do have two meetings set in the city for, uh, for tomorrow for the people who would like to have that information. We do have uh, some slips here with us tonight. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Murr, is going to come after I sit down and to kind of go into more detail briefly on exactly what we're looking for and how it works. Uh, we heard you guys, uh, uh, the citizens here in the city of Flint and the surrounding areas. There are tremendous funds available for you uh, if you guys take the time to get information to see if you test positive or negative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lane Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. President, uh, Madam Council, ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate the opportunity of letting us speak and to come here. And America's still alive. I've been sitting here listening tonight. <laughs> Ricky and I have worked in about 36 states in this country and about traveled in many countries, but we worked in about 19 countries. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you can't get up and say what you said here tonight in many countries. So you still live, we might have our problems, but you still live in the greatest country on the face of the earth. And don't ever forget it. Uh, we do want to appreciate the opportunity of being here, and uh, we want to take just a few minutes and appreciate the time. Uh, a number of years ago, many folks who worked in factories throughout our country was, uh, worked in, and it was exposed to asbestos. Asbestos has been around since the Roman Empire, and uh, it's, it came into this country, and they put it in battleships, they put it in schools, they put it in hospitals, they put it in factories, and years ago, and they found out it did a lot of good. It probably saved a lot of boys' lives on battleships in the World Wars, probably a lot of kids uh, and kept them getting burned up in schools. But it did a lot of bad. And the federal government, our federal government, and the manufacturers of asbestos uh, deceived the people about it and hid the fact that it caused a lot of lung problems. Um, so people that worked in factories and around filed lawsuits, not against Ford Motor Company or Chevrolet, but against the manufacturers of asbestos. And as a result of that, many people got a lot of money uh, out of asbestos exposure. There's different degrees of it. A 1-0 just means you got it in your lungs and you probably live a normal life and never have any problems. A 1-1 perfusion is a little worse. 2-0 is a little worse. 2-2 is worse. And then you see every lawyer in the country every 15 minutes on TV advertising mesothelioma, and that's a, that's a, 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 a asbestos exposure that you that you that that's a cancer that you can only get 
from asbestos exposure. And most folks that have meso live about five or six months. But the family before the bankruptcy days and asbestos manufacturers got, um, got about five or six million dollars. Uh, today, a meso case doesn't bring that much, and there's about 3,000 of them in the United States every year. Probably worth about a million dollars a day, but the person that has mesothelioma lives about five or six months. Most asbestos cases don't go that far, but they do can cause problems with lung cancer, colon cancer, esophagus and throat, and, and uh, stomach cancer. And so what we're doing, make it short, we, we come in and we uh, see people that qualify. The bankruptcy trust, the, the, when the companies took bankruptcy about 1998, um, Nobody fooled with asbestos. There wasn't any money in it, anything for anybody. And a couple of years ago, the bankruptcy uh, asbestos manufacturers went before the bankruptcy judge in Philadelphia and told them they wanted to come out of bankruptcy. They couldn't, kind of, they couldn't pay the kind of claims they used to pay, the kind of money, but they could pay some money. So the federal judge, bankruptcy judge, said, well, uh, some money, if they got asbestos in their lungs, is better than no money. So they decided uh, to let them come out of it, and they put $40 billion with a B in trust funds in Philadelphia. Uh, they set a guideline what you could test. Th thank you. You've expired. Time has expired. Okay. And uh, so anyway, we're here to, to, we're, members after the meeting we're here to like test that. folks. Uh, uh, we've been here about a month. We're not the firm out of Oklahoma, Texas that came in town last year and took people's application and never tested them. That's not us. But uh, we've got some flyers we kind of passed out. We appreciate the opportunity. And one thing when you get in trouble, Mr. Mr. Mayor, let me just tell you this. From, from down in Dixie, I found out a long time ago that there's somebody to call on when a city's in trouble, a country's in trouble, an individual's in trouble, a marriage is in trouble. And I found out God's phone number, and it's Jeremiah 33.3. Call unto to me, me and, I and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That's Thank right. you. Thank you. That's right. That's right. Our next speaker is Horace Cooper. Horace Cooper. <laughs> Autumn Adair. Miss Adair. Zara Maldonado. Uh, my name is Zara Maldonado. I came to you guys um, uh, in October or, or uh, November. Uh, I represent the uh, NABIT CWA Local 48 that represents uh, on-air talent photographers, um, engineers, and uh, editors and directors at WNEM TV5. I had asked the council to boycott WNEM TV5 while we uh, Right. Uh, tirelessly tried to uh, reach a, a collective bargaining agreement and uh, due to working schedules I've missed the last couple meetings where I had the opportunity we did reach an agreement All as right. of January uh, 19th um, I appreciate the the help that I did get from the council and those that that didn't I understand but I really appreciate that the help that uh, we got from the council and uh, it did help we got a deal you know as long as both sides aren't happy it's a good deal so thank you very much for your help it was only a four-year deal and it took us two years to get it so hopefully I won't be back in two years I appreciate your guys' hard work thank you for the opportunity solidarity brother God solidarity our next speaker is Christine Robinson Christine Robinson She's gone. Bethany Hazard Bethany Hazard Matt Taylor. Matt Taylor. See if Matt want to speak. There go Matt right there. He in the hallway. There you go. He said he's he right. he gone. Okay, Rosie B. Mays. She gone. Angie. I don't know. Angie doesn't have a letter. She gone. She's gone also. Mr. Yoni Grillchrist. He's spoken already. Valerie Welch. Suzanne Beach, I'm sorry, Broad, Suzanne Broad, Quincy Murphy, Phyllis House, and James Moore. Okay, that's it. Thank you.
All right, that concludes our speakers for this evening. Are there any council members that would like to address on city council? Yeah, time? Mr. President. You got to go. Okay, Councilman Nolan's leaving. Councilman Mays. Yeah, Mr. President, I did send everybody emails and my procedures to hear from the public. I heard a lot about low and water rates. I was in the public um, or the finance committee hearings, and I don't think we really proposed some to the emergency manager about low and water rates. I don't think we did what we could do as far as the Department of Economic Development. I know we didn't do the 2016 budget, and I don't know what's going on when I make a request that we need to meet. I'm really disappointed in this council as we go through parliamentary procedure classes. A motion was made on the floor, and for the first time in the history of the city of Flint have I seen a motion properly made and supported, and the chair would not call for discussion in the vote in a public meeting on record. I hope, in fact, that that motion is reflected in the minutes, and I think that democracy has just took a step back. We talk about the emergency manager not um, giving us a democracy. You are a plaintiff in a lawsuit, and then we get in a democratic meeting and a motion is made and properly seconded. I made it and Juantez Davis seconded Councilman Davis and my colleagues sit here and say nothing. Democracy has took a giant step backwards in this city of Flint when a chairperson won't ask for a discussion and a vote on a motion. That is outrageous. It's unprecedented in the city that I know. And for colleagues to go through parliamentary procedure class on a motion made and second, an appeal of the chair, is this the city that I'm living in now? It's never been done before. I talked to Matt. I've been in council meetings. Ms. Poplar, it's a very serious part of my business to be in a meeting of colleagues and a chairperson fails to really move forward in a democratic society, a body of nine, two people make a motion, don't ask for discussion, and then don't ask for the vote. You can vote me up and down, but you don't take away my democracy. And I know that emergency manager order inside and out. It says when you recognize a person, you're giving them the flow and you can dictate a reasonable time. And then at the end of that order, it says this is the five-minute time to comment on public speakers. Ms. Streeter, I went to court with you. I want my colleagues to know that I went down to the tax department with you and we found out your taxes had been paid. You didn't even tell them the worst that they had even put you in a straitjacket type situation. So I'm down here from November to now five and six days a week interacting with people and the more y'all try to make me look stupid by not entertaining a proper motion, the more people out there seem to come my way and support it. I don't care who shake their head and frown about how I, they think I act, but you might be, be misinterpreting the people. Ms. Streeter, I know that police will lie. I'm in a trial now where I've heard outrageous lies from some of the Flint police. Kevin Smith, I appreciate you and the good police. We have a fine police department. I'm on record for trying to fix the detective bureau. I understand patrol and detectives. I understand water rates. We haven't even did deficit reduction. So I'll try it again. I make a motion that we meet, do the budget, and Ms. Galloway, I believe that 80% of our recommendations got through. We've only did one budget year, and we haven't explored all the areas. But it's a bunch of fellas here who I think is in on it, and some of the new people don't get it, and some of the old ones must don't care, and they did a little perfunctory movement on the budget amendment and then say we can't meet no more. So I so move again. Thanks for lack of support. I ain't got no problem with that. God bless this city council. The next two years of this finance is on y'all. It won't be on me. Thank you.
<clears throat> Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you, um, Mr. President. First of all, I would like to congratulate one more time the class that just graduated last Wednesday from St. Luke's New Life Center. That was the largest class they ever had. I was their keynote speaker. <clears throat> they had 21 graduates. Some of them were here tonight, the, the young guys in the uh, green shirts. And those young guys started their own business. They call it New Life's Lawn and Snow Service. So that just goes to show if one wants to do something in the city of Flint, just use your head and you can come up with your own company, be your own entrepreneur. So my hat is off to New Life Center once again, to Sister Judy, and to Sister Carol, and shame on the city of Flint, shame on us, if we cannot give them some money to continue helping our community. Not another community, not Genesee County, but they're helping the city of Flint. Everyone that goes to New Life Center goes through the training, is from right here, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth wards. So let us please keep them in prayer because those two nuns are doing what the great commandment, and that is to help the least of these. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Poplar, Councilman Freeman. Councilman Davis, do you have anything tonight? Yeah, I just want to say this, uh, Council President Scott, is I proposed that the way that we can lower the water rates, we owe one million to water and nine million to sewer. I feel in my heart, even though it may be a part of the deficit elimination plan, I'm not certain if it is or if it isn't. Maybe somebody can correct me if it, if it is. Why do we have to pay back two million a year for five years when we can extend it? Even if we can't extend it to 20 years to pay 200,000 a year, we should be able to extend it for 10 years where we'll pay a lot less than that two million dollars. And the money that we save and gain we can give it back to the people and lower the water rates. I think that is a good way that how we can lower these water rates. I don't think that we have to be so haste to give this money back once a year for the next five years on the backs of the people. Now, I think there's some compromise that can go and play there, and I think that's the part that can be compromised with the people. We cannot just look at this high water rate and just say there's, it's, it's irrefutable. Because it should be refuted, and it should be a way that we can set a mechanism in place to reduce it. And I think all of us as a body can make that decision or at least refer it to the emergency manager that he makes that decision on the behalf of the residents. I do not think that we should be able to pay that back in five years. Remember, and I'm going to stay on that argument, or I'm going to stay on that suggestion. I'm going to be a little euphemistic and just use it as... I'm going to stay on that statement and saying of our argument that in that five years, we can extend it to at least 10 or 20 years, and whatever we save, we can lower the rates. I think that's a powerful statement, and I think that's a good way in doing it, and I think that should be on the record, and I think all of us collectively as a body should present that to the emergency manager because we owe it to ourselves. It's different if we owe it to a creditor. Or we owe it to somebody that can actually, you know, penalize us, garnish us, or take us to court, or whatever they can do. But we owe it to ourselves. If I put 20000 under my mattress and I take 15000 from up under there, I, pay, I put it back under there whenever I get ready to do it. As long as I put a little at a time, eventually the 20000 will get back. It just don't have to be given back next week. So I think that's the way how we should be able to look at that and lower the water rates. That just... That's just the way I think that we should be able to do it. If we have to think of somehow how to do it, I think that's the best way to do it. So I just want that on the record. Thank you. Councilman Neely. Yes, Mr. President. I just want to make a, one, one kind of uh, comment here. I want, the people to be, I want the people to be aware and very concerned, as I am, about some actions that the emergency manager has just taken recently. And this is our first meeting back since he took the action of putting forth the order 
saying, I believe, July 2nd, uh, that he's going to restore some power to the mayor over uh, planning and development and DPW. Uh, with this new organizational structure that, uh, that's been formulated by the emergency manager, and planning and development through this budget activity, all, most, mostly all city operations has been placed under planning and development. And DPW is our water and our infrastructure and different things of that nature. What the emergency manager order said that I thought I read is that, is it July 1st or 2nd? July the budget? Well, restoring power to the mayor. The beginning of the budget year. July 1, that he's going to restore that operations to the mayor. Now, the people should be concerned because of this. We have a, a, a situation in our community that we're not familiar to as American citizens with the emergency manager. But government has always been set up, and a democracy has always been set up, that you have co-equal branches of government, a check and balance for the people. Now, under this formulation of an emergency manager, through his um, giving power back to one of the co-equal branches of government, is only giving back the check and not the balance. We need to have some power restored to this body in order to perfect our local unit of government in total. You cannot give all operations to a mayor and administration who has failed us over and over and over again without having some power restored to the balance for the people. So I'm very concerned and I want people to be mindful and watch what is going on in our community uh, once this new planning and development operation takes hold because this is something new to all of us uh, as the mayor would take control over that operation. Uh, but we as council people should make a push to make sure that power is restored to this body so we can be that balance for the public. And I just wanted to bring that up, and, uh, Mr. Thank President. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilman Neely. Councilperson Galloway? No. Councilperson Van Buren? No comment. All right. Um, I don't have anything. Just for the record, our next council meeting will be June 23rd at 530, right here in the council chambers. We are adjourned. Sheldon. Pardon me.